Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Asad Lalji. Welcome to another exciting live session of Avid Online. And for those who are joining us for the first time, a special warm welcome to you. Uh, please refer to the chat box for more information on Avid, what we do, and information on our partners for this evening. And for those who have been tuning in throughout the year, I'd like to thank you for staying with us through this journey as we've transitioned online. As we look back on this year, it's certainly been a challenging one for all of us. And yet at Avid, it has brought us tremendous opportunity to innovate for the times and to continue in the work that we believe in. Our digital further learning campaign, Avid Online, debuted in April, is now in the ninth month, and we've completed over 140 programs. In fact, tonight, it marks the 146th program. And this platform has supported the creative communities and has also maintained a continuous dialogue with our audiences. Uh, these programs would not have been possible without you, our audiences, who have been tuning in regularly to our live sessions or logging into our YouTube channel to view our recorded episodes, uh, coming back and continuing to engage and learn and giving true to our mantra that learning never stops. As 2021 approaches, we endeavor to scale to new heights while continuing to spread the positivity of the arts to uplift, educate, and inspire our community. And this brings me to our evening session. From the outside looking in, the Western perspective on India's captivating culture. A fascinating live session that will explore foreign perspectives on the cultural nuances of the subcontinent. Please join me in giving a warm virtual welcome to our speakers, longtime New York Times contributor and author Perry Garfinkel, founder and CEO of Art uh, Adventures in Art, Karen Stone Talwar, and they will be in conversation with author of Bhagwan Kipakwan, Varud Gupta. For more about our very esteemed speakers, please refer to the chat box for their bios. Uh, please note that this session will be 75 minutes, followed by a 15-minute Q&A in which Varud will be taking questions. So please keep posting them in the, in the Q&A box throughout the session. On that note, thank you once again for tuning in. Over to you, Varud, and look forward to a fascinating session. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you, Avid, for having me back once more. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure. Uh, my name is Varud Gupta. I'm a author, writer, uh, but more than that, I think why the AVID team has asked me here today is that like our two esteemed panelists, uh, I've also been living kind of straddled between the two cultures. Uh, I grew up in the States, born and raised in Texas, uh, but about four years back, I found myself living in Delhi. And like most things in my life, it, became, it began with food. Uh, my first journey, my first exploration here was Bhagwan Ki Pakpan. It was a, an exploration of food and faith. Uh, but as I started to live here, it became more. It became heritage, it became family, it became culture, uh, became art, and which led me to my second project, which was the graphic novel Chotu. And throughout these work, uh, these projects, throughout my life, throughout the past few years, there's been a lot of questions I've asked myself, uh, specifically as someone who is Indian but lived outside in the States, now returning, you know, what is my place uh, how do I tell stories that might not necessarily be mine to be telling? And so I'm really, really excited to have these two panelists with me today. Um, I'm going to more or less ask them questions that have been in my mind for the past few years. And I'm hoping uh, throughout this conversation actually help me work through things that I've been thinking about. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it on to Karen to do a, a brief introduction about herself as well. Oh, thank you, Vern. I really do appreciate that. I want to thank the AVID team for sure. And also, Perry, thank you for being in conversation with me tonight as well. So I'm speaking to you all from New York City. So the black um, night time, I think in about an hour time, as we finish off, you'll see daylight here. But I've had the great pleasure of finding myself being in India since the year 2000. It was my very first trip to India. And since then, unfortunately not this January, I've gone back every single year. 
And in that time frame, I was going for four or five weeks. So my trajectory with India was I had the great fortune of going frequently. But then in 2007, I was the international gallery director for Bodhi Art, where I helped Bodhi open their New York offices. Well, gallery, I should say. And at that point of time, Bodhi had galleries in Bombay, Delhi, Singapore, Berlin, and New York. And it was a very exciting time because it was the first time the American market was able to see works from Atul Dodia, Anju Dodia, um, you know, Sabod Gupta, etc., in the New York area. Um, from there, I became the international managing director of, um, well, I'm sorry, the director of patrons for Asia Society. So here in New York, but obviously India was a very important factor of that part. And then I went on to find, be the founder of Adventures in Art. And in doing that, we take people around the world to look at art. And I've had the great fortune of taking American museum groups, which included Detroit, it included the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, San Jose. And now I also have private clients from Hong Kong, Switzerland, London, Europe, to come to India with adventures in art. So in the goodness of time, I do hope to be back. It doesn't, it won't be 2021 January, but it's certainly on the books for November, 2021 and Jan, 2022. So fingers crossed. And I look forward to really talking about the passion of adventures in art and their big trip every year, which is going to India. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm in the exact opposite time zone. So the way light will be coming in to your house over time, light will be disappearing from the hills of Manali on my end. Um, so it might get a little bit dark. But I'm now going to pass it on to Perry. Would you like to give yourself a brief introduction? Yes, yes. Good morning or good evening, wherever you are. I'm in Berkeley, California, cool Berkeley, California. So I'm far enough away from you all that I don't have to wear this, thank the Lord. Uh, I have a long history with India. I was, uh, I was among the wave of Westerners in the 1970s who uh, disenchanted with uh, the West and lacking the, the answers that we were looking for, we came East. Uh, I read the Hermann Hesse, Journey to the East, the beat poets like Allen Ginsberg and uh, Jack Kerouac, who were imbibing the uh, Buddhism and Hinduism of the East. I read a book called Be Here Now in the 70s. And uh, my then wife and I decided we, if uh, Richard Nixon was reelected president, which he was, we, we would go around the world and we open a map. And for some reason that we both of us still do not know, why we decided India would be our destination. And we traveled over land and, uh, and we arrived and we spent, we had mapped a worldwide journey. But when we got to India and realized how big it was and how compelling and fascinating it was, we blew off the rest of our trip and we stayed in India six or nine months. I had very, very formative experiences. This is with my tabla guru. Guru, I'm a lifetime drummer. So uh, looking at the music of India was part of why I wanted to come. We were looking for a guru. She uh, went in search of a guru that we knew of from this book in, in Lucknow. He was then in Nanital. She never found him. But India left us with this drop of, of insight. And when we came back to America, we had this plan, believe it or not, we were going to win the lottery and then go back and live in India. That did not happen. 30 years later, I came back as a journalist writing for National Geographic magazine. I had been a a writing for the New York Times as a contributor for probably 15 years before that. And as a journalist, I saw India through a whole different set of eyes 
had uh, interviews with some of the most amazing people in the world. In a while, I'll tell you about my interview with His Holiness the Dalai Lama in uh, uh, Dharamsala, McLeod Ganj. And I've been going back to India almost every year now since about 2004. And I've worked with hotel, I've worked with the Taj Hotels developing a book. I was a consultant to the Maharana of Mewar, Arvind Singh Mewar and his family, the Mewar family in Udaipur. And uh, I've go, I'm in the midst of finishing helping a friend ghostwrite a book. Uh, and uh, as Karen said, uh, this year I was planning to come back because in December and January of this past year, I began research for my next book. Uh, the, I should have said the book that uh, was resulted from my first trip in 2004 was entitled Buddha or Bust. Let's see if you can see it. It's too, too much light. Um, now I'm working on a book to be entitled Being Gandhi. So it's a kind of sequel to that book. And I came back to India in December and January uh, to follow in the footsteps of Gandhi from his birthplace in Porbandar. And, uh, and I did the Gandhi uh, salt march, the Dandi path. And uh, I left India February 2nd. And I heard people talking about this virus and I didn't really pay attention to it. I just thought, it's some nerds, you know, obsessed with um, viruses. Little did we know what happened. But from India, I went to South Africa and I spent two weeks there, again, gone, following Gandhi. And uh, I'm just itching to come back, uh, hopefully this spring. So that's my story for the while. Perfect. Thank you, Vaughn. Thank you very much. I think we're actually hoping both of you make it back very soon. I'm sure you both are ready to uh, continue your experiences here. With that, so my first question for the both of you. Uh, I wanna want you both to take us into the past. Uh, for a moment, tell us what was the first trip uh, that brought you to India? And specifically, I want to know the perspective that you had before and after that trip. You know, what was in your mind of what is India as a country, as a culture? And how did that one trip maybe start to change that perspective? Or what thinking or what path did that first trip kind of lead you down onto, which kind of built such a well-connected history that you both have now with the country? Sharon, yeah. let, let me start because I came earlier and then chron chronologically, I'm very curious, Karen, to see what it was like for you the first time. Okay. But when Thank I landed, you. may I? Of course, please do. Yes. So when I came, uh, uh, I remember the, the, my first impression, and we had taken a, a bus, I think it was, from Amritsar to New Delhi. And that first morning, we woke up and we went into Connaught Place. And at that time, it was a, a vast, big uh, uh, lawn, basically, not like it is today. And it was... I mean, literally, there were snake charmers with baskets and cobras and people offering to give massage. Uh, people were walking around in, in lungies and white pajama pants. Very few, you see very few of that today. Uh, my first impression of India was information overload, sensory overload. And it took weeks to get my feet and understand uh, what was going on and you know, I picked up a vocabulary of about a hundred Hindi words, words in Hindi that got us, you know, to the American Express office and, and here and there around. Uh, I next came um, several years later, but um, almost 20 years later, 30 years later, but uh, we did the traditional circuit at the time, which was places like Kajaraho, Goa, um, we tried to get to Udaipur at the time, but it just didn't happen. We were in Bhopal and, and uh, uh, um, uh, we went to Sarnath uh, and Varanasi, basically the traditional triangle. We went to Agra and we traveled alone, just the two of us. And uh, we saw people traveling in groups and we felt that we're going to get the real experience. Uh, I don't know now in retrospect whether that was real or just our real. 
But it left, as you asked, it left a lasting impression. Obviously, I, I was fascinated, perplexed, turned off and turned on at the same time. How could these people be doing this? And then over the years of coming back later, I understood more and more. But it was compelling enough uh, that, that I wanted to come back. Uh, I should just say, and then I'll turn it over to Karen, the highlight for me was because I have been, I've played drums my whole life. We ended up in Benares and went to one evening to a concert at Benares Hindu University, BHU. And we saw a concert in the evening in the center of the university of the music department. I, the music just took me out and up and away and in. And uh, these uh, towels, uh, stayed with me to the point where every day in India, the, the, the sound of the wheels on the cobblestone streets, dogs barking, horns conking, all fit into this 16 beat meter. And I came home full of this, this music. Everybody has a way into their own way into spirituality. Uh, for me, it was the music. And from there, it, it built on. But let's come back, uh, Karen. Oh, thank you, Perry. I remember it distinctly. It was January 2000. And when you arrive in India from the New York area, you, you get in around one o'clock, two o'clock at night. I, I remember that, or I should say morning. And my first, which always happens to me, is you, the smells, the wonderful aura. But for me, it was the very first time. So there I was, and I was going, frankly, it was my honeymoon. So, and I, at the time, married to an Indian man. And so I was so excited to see this country. So we got in the car to drive from Bombay, and we were going to the Taj Hotel. And I remember being fascinated by just, you know, how active the city was at two in the morning. And... The, the traffic and the noise and being a dog lover, I just couldn't believe all the dogs I would see running around. And we checked into the Taj and we were in the old part of the Taj and our room was overlooking the gateway. And I remember just standing at the window and it was sad for me to see, I don't see it now when I stay at the Taj, but truly the beautiful, um, women's colors and saris lined up sleeping, you know, on the sidewalks in front of the Taj, but the, the colors really come back to me. And so I saw Bombay and that light. And then we went down to Delhi and, you know, I did what any first American would do. You know, I wanted to go shawl shopping. I wanted to go jewelry shopping. I wanted, you know, to go to Khan Market. And then had a very interesting experience after that. So the, going down to Pondicherry, which is a very different part of India than Bombay and Delhi. And it's a long car ride you know, from the airport. And um, my in-laws were followers of the mother in Sherobindu. And so for a Western Christian woman to go for the very first time to an ashram, was wonderful and exciting to just sit there amongst individuals looking, you know, where the relics are held and going into the room where the mother, you know, was her bedroom or a prayer room. And that, that will stay with me a lifetime, my trip to Pondicherry. And I, I have to say to date, it's the only time I did go down to Pondicherry, you know, but seeing the palm trees, it was reminding me of the Caribbean. And so since 2000, which we'll talk about more, you know, I've gone back many times and seen many other cities, but the first three were Bombay, Delhi, and Pondicherry. Perfect. So I like how you brought up, Karen, the smells of India. Uh, for me as a child, I used to visit every summer. And I vividly remember the smell, like when you step off of the airplane, there's a very strong smell. Um, 
Today, as an adult, though, I know that's actually pollution in the air that you're smelling, <laughs> that, that first whiff off the airplane. And I think it's only natural that as you visit a country, your definitions, your experiences over time also develop. Uh, Perry, you mentioned something very important, the real experience. So I'd be curious to know for each of you, what was that real experience? And how maybe has that real experience kind of changed over the years as you spent more time in the country? Or what, what does that real experience mean to you now? Uh, Karen, if you want to start us off. Well, I think the real experience, thanks for, I don't know, I'm obviously talking off the top of, top of my head, you know, I think for me, looking outside the window of the Taj Hotel and seeing, you know, all various different people sleeping in front of the Taj, and that was 2000, and the last time I was back was 2019, that as the city has become much more cosmopolitan and people, you don't really see that, you know, in front of the Taj has become much more an international facade where people are strolling etc whereas back 20 years prior it was not so Varun, I'm, I hope I'm answering your question but um, I think that it was more natural people were cooking on the streets etc and you don't see that as much now in the major downtown areas that I travel to. I have an interesting uh, perspective and a kind of addendum to what Karen said. Uh, there are two, in my mind, there are two Indias and uh, there are many Indias. In fact, I'm always reminded of the story of the blind men and the elephant. You know that story? Uh, the blind men, 10 different blind men are asked to touch an elephant and to explain it. And one touches the tusk and thinks it's a smooth thing. Another touches the ears and thinks it's a floppy thing. India is hundreds, if not thousands of different experiences. And to me, the epitome uh, from, from my real experiences was when we were in Bombay in 19, what was it? It was the early 70s, mid 70s. We travel very much as American hippies, third class Indian rail, uh, we slept, uh, we, we built a hut on the beaches of Goa and palm huts and we lived in that. But one, a few nights we stayed at the Red Cross in Bombay, Mumbai, uh, diagonally across from the Taj Mahal Palace Hotel that Karen was referring to. And we're spending, you know, uh, there were 10 rupees a night and separate dorm rooms. And I remember taking Iris out and seeing the Taj and in my memory, it was very far away. And I said, someday I'm going to afford to take us to the Taj Mahal Palace Hotel, even though we were leaving our bourgeois American roots to, you know, live, live uh, simply in India. 2004, I came back on assignment for National Geographic magazine, having written for the New York Times for 20 years. And I was uh, staying at the Taj Mahal Palace Hotel. And I, and I, one afternoon, I said, I'm going to go find this where I stayed. And I, I circumnavigated, uh, circumambulated the entire area and could not find the Red Cross. And as I was coming back, it was literally across the street and, you know, diagonally across the street. And to me, it represented both me then and me now in 2004, and India then, India now. And one is always struck coming from the West at the disparity between uh, wealth, middle class and, and lower class. One of the major differences I saw when I came down back in 2004 was that there was a rising middle class. So those Indians we saw in lungis and pajama pants were now wearing uh, Western sports jackets and pants, albeit on the cheap side, but there was a, there was a shift, uh, an entire shift. And I think for, for the world began to wake up in another way to India with the Y2K phenomenon. And we here in the West were looking to India for the answers. My generation had looked to India for spiritual answers. And now uh, the coming of age of India was about technological advance. So, so that's a little small, small moments I can talk about. 
Oh, it's perfect. Uh, thank you. So I'm going to switch over to one of the first conversation topics for today. And there's an idea of when you go to a new country, um, you can go as a tourist, you can go as deeper exploration, or you can go as like, you know, an immersion into a culture. Uh, so Perry, I want to start off with you. When you're actually writing about India, when you started off writing for Nat Geo and then for New York Times about India, you know, how as an outsider did you kind of like navigate through the different types of experiences you can have in a country you know how did you kind of get genuine with that writing um not to play to stereotypes or like preconceived notions too much and kind of like really convey what what the india was that you were feeling and experiencing well this is a let's not turn this into a writer's workshop but it's a <laughs> it's a it's a writer's question for sure i always write even though i write in the third person for the new york times and uh, I get to write in first person from time to time. I always write from experience. So the first article I ever tried to freelance was a, a I call it a Valentine to my tabla guru because I had experienced it and I had lived with his family in Benares. He was uh, from a very famous Kirana. He was uh, the chair of the tabla department at BHU and and, and so, and that was when I came home to America and I said, oh, I can write. And, and if I write from experience and, and my agenda was to help people understand themselves more. So there was a spiritual, you know, uh, component to everything I've written about. Ba basically, India is where you go for that kind of inspiration. Uh, years later, when I came back, uh, I had a more objective eye and I, and I could see things as they are, as you say, in reality. I know when I came in the 70s, um, one of the things I learned was not to make cross-cultural comparisons. Uh, who is to say? Uh, the, the, the anecdote is that my then wife and I spent a half a day looking for toilet paper. And we were appalled at the idea that the Indians did not use toilet paper. I, I could not, I could not get it. And you know, years have gone by, and I do understand it. And uh, but that's like the microcosm of the difference in real time. Living with this Indian family, where uh, the my tabla guru, there was no toilet paper, so I learned the Indian way, and I and and I came home realizing. Every level of comparison between uh, wealth, poverty in India, you cannot, you know, the currency doesn't translate to here. Our middle class is not India's middle class. Uh, I live in a middle class life, but I don't have people living in my house who cook for me and clean my house. A lot of middle class Indians have that. Um, so th does that address some of your question? Yes, absolutely. And I want to pivot and I want to ask Karen the same exact thing. Um, from someone who brings people into the country, how do you also kind of navigate between these different philosophies of how to experience India? You know, that's, an, that's a great question because our trips, obviously we are staying at hotels throughout. But one of the things that I do try to do, and very kindly, many host and hostesses host us for a meal, et cetera, at their homes. And we are seeing homes in India, whether it's Delhi, Bombay, Hyderabad, et cetera. But there's certain things that, um, you know, that they're learning along the way that's so obvious for Indians in that, as soon as they walk in, they're take you know, to try to explain, you know, most Indians will ask you to take off your shoes or not ask you, but assume, et cetera. So that's not common for the Western view. Um, you're often asked, are you veg or non-veg? Well, I mean, that's pretty basic, vegetarian, non-vegetarian, but people don't really get that. So there's little incidences that they're getting to expose themselves to when they're able to go to someone's home, they're able to understand what, you know, how the Indians live uh, within the home. And there's a beautiful saying that I often use, 
And I think it's so true, and I can't quote who said it, but a city becomes a world when you love someone within it. Mm. And it's so true because I can say that about Paris, I could say it about Geneva, but certainly India, that when they're able to be in the home of an Indian, it becomes a very different experience than being at a Taj or Oberoi. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, within the same vein, Karen, uh, so what was it about art and jewelry that really fascinated you? Um, and I'd be very curious to know, like, how has that art and culture kind of gone back to the state? Um, you know, we, we talk about things such as cultural appropriation, but at the same time, we talk about a topic as an intercultural exchange. Um, and there can often be a fine line between the two. Uh, so I'd be curious to know what your thoughts are on this. Um, Dwani, if we could actually put up Karen's pictures at this point too, um, as she talks a little bit more about jewelry and art, that'd be great. Thank you, thank you. Well, maybe go through some of the pictures and answer the questions I can, but in going through India, we try to, you know, you're going to see some highlights of, you know, various, I call it, you know, tourist destinations, but fantastic destinations. So we have spent some time at the Tiger Reserves, which has been absolutely wonderful. Next. And of course, this is shawl shopping in Delhi. And the woman towards the front, if you don't know, is Jenny Housegrow. And Jenny is the grand niece of John Singer Sargent, which is one of, you know, in, well, he's American, but spent most of his time in England and some in Italy. But Jenny has spent pretty much her in past 30 years in India. So to be able to spend some time with Jenny, who's beyond a legend, um, and obviously, you know, has built a wonderful shawl business with a man by the name of Asif Ali. But it's a great place to see an English person transformed into India and be able to have the conversations we're having now. Next. Of course, being able to experience um, Indian food. And I always get a little horrified, you know, when um, you do travel with Westerners. I remember being in Morocco and someone explaining that the food in the, in the Italian restaurant wasn't that, that good. Well, you come to India and you need to experience Indian food, so. Next. Here we are. And not many Americans, you know, would wear a sari, and certainly we would need a dresser to show us how to put one on. But spending time with Tarun here, and a woman from Pittsburgh, and being able to understand a sari, how it's worn, how it's draped. And obviously they did find other clothes within there, whether it was a vest or a jacket, et cetera. Next. And of course, nothing like shawl shopping and just going wild. And that pile was the pile the woman was taking home in front. Next. And just watching various things that, you know, how to, how to tie the turban. And this man went from start to finish for us and obviously wanted a tip at the end, which we were happy to do. But it was one thing that, you know, no one had really seen how to put, how a turban is, is placed on someone's head and wrapped. Next. And just, you know, fine dining and being able to sit back and really explore how we, you know, how we've spent the day. And, you know, right here you have, I can tell you the front people are from South Africa. One of the women's from Hong Kong. One of the women, women is from Lebanon. So, you know, we come from very different backgrounds to experience a magical experience of India. Next. And my passion for jewelry and art, thank you for pointing that out. But we were going to Jaipur and we wanted to actually see them cutting diamonds. And they, 
were not able to take us to the factory and Indians being so hospitable, set up, set up the entire how to cut diamonds in the garden. And we spent an afternoon learning how to cut diamonds. And this is at Gion, next. And getting a lecture on the facets of cutting diamonds, next. And then the tour within the workshop, which is fascinating for us to watch jewelry being made. Obviously, we tend to love the end product, but watching it throughout the various steps. Next. And that man was from Brazil in the front. So again, I'm bringing an entire international group to experience India. Oh, this is my dear friend Siddharth of Gem Palace and his dad, Munu, in the background. And this is in the Jaipur Atelier. And we're getting an education and shopping, as you can see the credit card machine in the front, but looking <laughs> at any <Indian> jewelry. <laughs> Next. And obviously the frenzy of looking, buying, trying. Next. Here's the Indian art fair. And I must say, I, and obviously it's Subodh Gupta with some wonderful collectors from New York City. And um, they have one of the largest sculpture gardens outside of New York City, uh, Joel and Sherry Malin. But Subodh um, standing in front of his piece. But I do try <clears throat> to, in the past years, always do a trip around the Indian Art Fair because we have um, various museums groups. Last group I took was Detroit Institute. Um, so obviously art is very important to them and they like to acquire pieces for themselves personally as well as for the museum. So it's easy to see it under one roof and the Indian Art Fair has done a terrific job. Next. And obviously we have the good fortune of being um, to go to all the side, various brunches, et cetera, part of the Indian art fair. So this is in Delhi. Next. And no trip is complete without us all visiting um, the Taj Mahal. And I always try to get people when we do go to go first thing in the morning to get up six, 6.30 and um, to have that experience and then go back in the afternoon. And there's nothing, nothing for, I believe not only an American or a Western, but for anyone, when you walk through those gates and see the first sight of the Taj Mahal, it's a <gasps> experience. And I have it every single time. I go to the Taj and I've been now on numerous occasions. Next. And this is private collections. And that's, um, it's wonderful to go into an, a home of an Indian collector and understand why they have collected various art. Many times they add Western art to their collection and some of the Indian art and the Indian contemporary art that they're collecting as well as antiquities. Next. Here's the home of Karen Nadar and the man to her right is Salvatore Sanz Ponte. He is from Spain, but he's the international director of the Detroit Institute and really leading a very trailblazing experience in Detroit and Karen kindly receiving us at a luncheon around the Indian Art Fair. Next. And this is Renu Modi, who kindly has invited us to her home. And um, she has one of the only homes de designed by M.F. Hussein. And you have to understand for many of my Western collectors, it's the first time they're hearing the names like M.F. Hussein and Souza, et cetera. Next. And I had the great pleasure, it's my second time. Thank you, Assad and team. And this was a lecture given in Bombay back, I gather two years ago on the heritage of the city and had the great fortune of having a wonderful audience as we do today to listen to the, her 
to listen to me. So I thank you. Next. And again, uh, um, speaking on the heritage of the city. So I thank you. And just one or two more photographs of us enjoying very fine dining. And this here was at the Raj Mahal Palace in Jaipur. And as you see us all together, but it's an experience of us debriefing from the day with wonderful Indian cuisine. Next. And this is a final picture I present to you that was my Hong Kong clients in Utaipur. And this was us being received by the Maharana and his wife, Avid Singh Moore. And we did go to the palace and we went for a drink and you know, to hear his perspective on running his Utaipur. So thank you. Yeah, so just a, a follow-up to this, Karen. Uh, when we talk about the art and jewelry in India, uh, how has it gone back and maybe kind of influenced uh, whether um, taste or perspectives within the clientele that you brought um, to the country? You know, sure. how has art in India kind of influenced the art and culture of other countries. Thank you for that. And I hope I understand the question correctly. But I brought some Chinese clients from Boston to India, and they had not um, had the good fortune of hearing of Subodh Gupta. And kindly, we spent time with Subodh, we spent time at his studio, and they purchased a piece for the museum. So they were so excited to experience India and to have the wonderful, you know, seeing Indian art to bring it back to Boston so that everyone could enjoy the piece. But for, I remember when I was the international, when I was the, the director of Bodhi Art, and again, coming from a very Western perspective, although I had a couple people on my team on the Indian that were Indians. And we opened the gallery with the show of Atul Dodia. And it was a wonderful, wonderful um, experience and a wonderful show. And Atul had a piece called Shabri and it was Shabri shaking a tree. Now for me, and it's a children's, I grew up with Goldilocks. I never grew up with Shabri. So, it takes an education to have to expose yourself to the various gods, goddesses, stories that an Indian child might have grown up that sometimes used in the contemporary art scene. And it becomes a fascinating story to learn about. Uh, if I can now switch it over to Perry. Uh, when we talk about such things as art and jewelry um, and culture, we're talking about soft power, right? We're talking about a nation's ability to influence in ways that might not be economic or political. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. One thing, Perry, that you've done a lot of is talk about food in India. Um, I would also love to know your perspective on soft power, you know, the ability for India to influence other countries, but also quickly about food. Um, you know, food now kind of has left India and is being more mainstream in U.S. palettes. And so I'd like to know, you know, has food also kind of played a role in getting people or understanding about Indian culture? Well, uh, that's a good question. And um, I, I should say I broke into the New York Times writing about food trends from San Francisco, which would, had become an epicenter of innovative food trends. It was where the term foodie began, became popular. Celebrity chefs, marquee chefs. So... Uh, but I have a little confession to make. I don't love Indian food. Um, it's uh, often too spicy for me. When I told you that story, when we arrived at a hotel in Connaught uh, Place, the first time I ate Indian food in India, it was so hot, I had to jam rice and yogurt into my mouth to stop the fire. I, I adapted, but... Um, 
And then when I came back years later as a working journalist and I got to interview people like uh, Amant Oberoi, who had been executive director of the, of the executive chef at the Taj Hotels. And then I um, uh, met and became friends with Rahul Akerkar, whose restaurant Indigo was a, a groundbreaking restaurant of Western style food. He melded his, um, he's, he was half uh, Jewish and half Indian, half uh, had gone to school in the US and he did work for chefs in New York. So he brought a different sensibility. And then through him, I, and I helped him finish his uh, book, which is forthcoming. Um, I got to see the food world of India in a whole new way. And what we see now, let me just say, is breakout uh, uh, innovation, the melding of East and West. And, and isn't that what you know, one hopes for? Look, you're a, you're a walking example. Uh, there's a whole wave of uh, young Indians from America who are coming back to India to try to find their roots. And, and food is always the way, you know, there's that saying, uh, the eyes are the window to the soul. Well, food is also the window to the soul of a country. And every region of India, every village even has its own masalas and its own traditions. When I was in Rajasthan and I spent a lot of time in Udaipur with the uh, Shriji and, and uh, lived at the Palace Hotel there, I learned about the food of Rajasthan. It's, it's kind of bitter. There's uh, those greens that uh, you might remember, you might know the name of them and tasting them was very bitter, but they were reflective of the people. But as I said, now um, I ate in restaurants in, in Kerala, in Kochi, uh, uh, in um, Bengaluru, uh, in, in Delhi. And there are these amazingly gourmet restaurants doing blending of food because I think now the global palate is adapting lots of different flavors and tastes. So we'll see more cumin in the food here. Um, and they'll see more, uh, Indians will see more basil. Now there's, you know, you know, there's two kinds of basil, Tulsi and the, the kind the Italians use. So, but the Indian chefs are using both and with, with lots of creativity. All that said, uh, I'm a kind of fundamentalist, you know, a, a, uh, a, 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 a naturalist. So I like the food free of too much gimmick and vertical rising. Uh, just one time, and I won't say which restaurant, but uh, I went to a, a new restaurant uh, in, in New Delhi, and this was maybe 2004 or five, and I asked for the same dish with three or four different proteins. Uh, I wanted a, a curry with um, meat, chicken, and fish. And I did a blind tasting, and I could not tell the difference among those three proteins because they were buried by the curry. Now, um, it's not just because Indians are trying to uh, uh, serve the Western palate, but there's a different understanding about how to let the food speak for itself, the ingredients speak for themselves. So, so that's what, and, and I should just say, just uh, lots of little varied comments. Your original comment in Karen's about the smell of India, uh, we know that the olfactory nerve is, has the longest memory of any of our senses. So I too, when I land in India, I can close my eyes and, and say, I'm here, <laughs> I'd be here now, um, because it's a very unique smell and it's a combination and not just the pollution, it's all the incense. It's the smells from everybody's kitchens. It's uh, the people, the dogs, the, the, the streets themselves. Um, that's a, a smell I've never experienced anywhere else in the world. But back to the food, uh, it, I, I hope uh, no one criti criticizes me for not loving the food, but uh, I also admire the chefs. And, and for me, let me just say, while, while Karen has uh, focused on the art and, and uh, the archi architecture, right? I am a people person. 
So to me, it's, you know, my stories come from the experiences with people and people are the kind of cultural microcosm of the entire country. So when we talk about the soft goods, the softness, it's, it's, uh, it's the people who I, you know, identify with and tell stories around. And I made a short list of the, the, the you know, the amazing people I've in, interviewed in India. Uh, but uh, I can say uh, two or three that can, if I may mention now, I interviewed His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and uh, he's a, a, a Tibetan in exile in India, as well as the government of, of uh, Tibet is in exile. And this was, as Karen ex said, one of the, the most ex amazing experiences of her life. My interview with him changed me fundamentally. Uh, just going up to that area of the world is, you know, the highest peaks approaching the Himalayas. But I loved interviewing him. And um, when I'm down, when I'm feeling down, I have the tape of my interview with him. And I, every time he laughed, and His Holiness has this very recognizable, deep laugh, I, I held the microphone closer to him when he laughed, and, and I listened to that. But more recently, and in the art world, I did a profile of Divya Thakur, who is uh, one of the leading designers who designs um, furniture, uh, sculptures, uh, exhibitions. And she put together this thing now she's uh, all, all about is called the uh, Museum of Design Excellence Mode. And I spent time with her in India before I left. And then to do the interviews with the New York Times, we spent many weeks Skyping and FaceTiming. Uh, she's the, the new India, the future of India, and finding ways to take a little bit of the West and bring it into the East and vice versa. But her Museum of Di Design Excellence is platformed by Google Arts and Culture. And it's a kind of, uh, it was an idea whose time was very perfectly uh, arrive with the lockdown, people are not able to go to museums. So now they can experience the art and the architecture and all of the wonderful art forms through the medium that we're sitting in right here. I, I highly recommend that you go to her, her website, Museum of Design Excellence. That's it for here. Thank you. So, uh you brought up a very interesting thing when it comes to food, right? Um, at first, you maybe had that kind of stereotype of Indian food being very spicy, uh, but it took time to kind of overcome that. And it took experiences to kind of figure out, you know, there's a plurality, so there's a diversity to the cuisine. Um, I'd like to know more about as we turn from past to present of your experiences in India, um, are there other stereotypes that you had maybe previously kind of encountered and your time here has kind of slowly overcome. And uh, if Karen, if you want to start us off on this one. Oh, that's- I believe I broke up for a second. If my did, connection I think, was I think unclear- I heard the question, know. stereotypes. Oh, that's a good one. Okay. You know, I always, I guess prior to coming to India over the past years, I, think of Indians being very good with numbers and very good with technology. And I remember if I had any computer prog problems or questions that when I was at the Taj, and obviously I try to arrive a couple days earlier before my guests to work out all the kinks. And I would sit there with the Taj computer man coming to my room and answering all these questions. And I say that jokingly, but you couldn't ever do that in an American hotel. I mean, you know, and I think it's the stereotype that Indians are so good with numbers and so good with computer solutions and always amazed that Indian numbers can be nine digits. And before, you know, you had numbers in your cell phone and you were back in the year 2000 with, I think the flip phone, everyone remembered everyone's phone numbers. And it was just natural. And, you know, they hadn't dialed it in six or eight months. So there's certain stereotypes like that that come to life 
that I still think are true. Uh, Perry, did you have any, any experiences of stereotypes before? Yeah. Yeah, uh, later uh, there's uh, somebody who posted a question. I hope uh, you'll see that and we can answer that person's question later. Are you seeing them? Oh, he froze. Um, yeah, uh, you know, when I was a kid, uh, the, the line was, eat your vegetables, they're starving in India. Uh, there are many people starving in India. But I've had the opportunity to see, you know, I've interviewed Dalits in, in Nagpur in the most humblest settings. And I've dined with uh, Maharaj, Maharanas and uh, some of the wealthiest people in India. I think the stereotype is that, there's the, that their Indians are poor or they're very wealthy. The Forbes uh, list of the 10 most, uh, 10 wealthiest men in the world, people in the world, I think what, three or four of them are Indians, uh, the Ambani's and others like that, the Birla's. So um, it's, uh, it's not an easy question to answer because uh, there's gray areas. But I uh, have landed in situations where I'm with people who are, come from a much higher class than I do, but they are also very welcoming. And, uh, and I've been humbled in some of the situations I've been uh, where, as I said, I've interviewed Dalits and uh, very, very, very uh, uh, poor people living in, you know, eight people in a, in a space the size of my kitchen. But in all of them, there is a, is, there's a generosity and a humility. Uh, Pani, you know, Pani, uh, everybody will offer you a glass of water to start. The wealthy and the poor, that's, that's the welcome committee. And it's a gesture. Water is the thing we all need. So, so I love that. Um, um, there are some things that have not been, uh, there's no dichotomy. From my first trips in India, I was always confused about uh, Indian sense of time. Uh, apparently the East and the West have a different sense of time. Uh, in India, when somebody says to you, just now coming, this could be soon or never. Uh, 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 we have a little more responsibility when that is, comes to pass. Indians are very rarely on time. Uh, I know the, the Maywar family is very punctual about this kind of thing. But um, this was uh, one of the things I learned was patience that, okay, this is another cross-cultural thing you cannot compare. So I learned to the, the old expression, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. When in India, I adapt. And I think that's, you know, if you ask me for some lessons, it would be uh, what I've learned over the years is patience. Everything happens in the time it's supposed to happen. I've seen I've, uh, this, this wedding I went to, uh, Padmaja's wedding. I stayed at one of the... Um, hunting lodges that was turned into an, a, an accommodation. Three days before the wedding, I didn't imagine that this cricket field was gonna be turned into an, a, you know, an arena for 4,000 guests. And for 72 hours, hundreds of Indians came in and built this thing. And I've seen this time and time again, that you think it's not gonna happen, and then these miracles happen. So, so I learned that. And, and Indians have the long view. I learned this again from uh, Sriji, the Maharana of Mewar, that I was writing something for him. And he said, you are writing for the vertical audience. We are here for the long term. And when you look at the history of India compared to the, the little country I come from, only 200 and something years old, I began to understand time and length of time and that Indians take their time. There's a, there's a whole process of, of, uh, of trying to figure out the answer to any problem. Uh, what Karen said is Indians are, uh, uh, this brilliance of Indians is that they go 360 degrees around every problem, even where should we meet for dinner? Uh, whereas Americans go from point A to point B, the shortest distance between two points. We think that the straight line gets us there. 
But Indians understand that it's the process. That's what life is about. We're engaged, we're dialoguing. So these are among the things I've learned and the differences between then and now. Perfect, thank you very much. And yes, um, we will get to the questions. This is a great reminder point. I have a few questions left for the two panelists. And can uh, I just add one point to Perry's point? Oh yeah, please, please, absolutely. Because it, it makes me chuckle. Um, the one thing that I always, you know, is coming from America, you know, when I ask in India, you know, can you give me directions to this store? It's over there. And I'll say, what do you mean by over there? You go down this street, take a right, take a left. No, it's over there. It's over there. And you make me chuckle, Perry, because getting directions in India for me over there is definitely not helpful. But I always remember, you know, I better get the Google Maps out. <laughs> yeah. Um so I have a few questions left. Uh, anyone else that says, has any specific questions, please go ahead and type it into the chat box and we'll get to it in about 15 minutes. Um, but some specific things, uh, back to you, Perry. Uh, one thing that you did really interesting this past year was the Salt March. And you're writing a book specifically around Gandhi. Uh, my first question is why? Um, what was it that brought you to this? And the follow on is, would you share some of the learning, some of the experiences that you took away from this? Yes, I'll, I'll give you uh, highlights, but you know, you'll have to buy my book and read it. Um, what, what, what prompted me to do this, it really goes back to when uh, Barack Obama was running for president and he had this uh, phrase, be the change. And that came from Gandhi's uh, famous line, be the change you want to see in the world. It was, it's a, it's a commentary on being proactive and make your future what you want it to be. So this idea was seeded then. It took almost eight years to, to um, get a publisher. And now Simon and Schuster India is publishing my book in India. And there's an American publisher, uh, Sounds True, and German Random House is also publishing it. But the impetus was that we are living in an age of where morals seem to be on the decline. <clears throat> the telling subtitle of my book is Being Gandhi, my, my experiment following the Mahatma's moral principles in these immoral times. And when I looked around to see who's holding the moral compass, there's very few examples. And Gandhi, while he is controversial in some regards, uh, no one argues with the, the, the spiritual and lifestyle principles that he laid down, uh, politics aside. And, I, and since I knew India, um, but I knew very little about Gandhi, except that he's on every coinage and, and his statue is in every, every uh, city center and uh, th everything is named after him. Uh, I felt that in, in talking to people, there was a really superficial understanding of who Gandhi was. So, so that's why I wanted to write this book because I feel, I feel that now more than ever, we need truth and nonviolence. And these are the two main principles that I'm following. Um, and there's you know, subtle levels of understanding about what truth is and what nonviolence is that I'm following that I will write about. So um, uh, and half of my book is my introspective diaries about my attempt to follow these principles. And the other half is as a good reporter going to the places that were formative to his life. And so obviously I had to go to Gujarat. And when I said uh, about the blind men and the elephants, in my many years of coming to India, there's two um, holes in my travels. One of them is South India, because in the beginning, I was afraid of the heat. I don't like the heat. Now that I've been acclimated, and I, I like the heat, actually, as long as there's AC at the other end of my day. But Gujarat, I knew nothing about. I had never been to. And uh, I have to confess, when I arrived there, I didn't know that it was a, a, a dry state. You cannot buy alcohol in Gujarat. And, and almost all the restaurants are mainly vegetarian. And this is the influence of Gandhi. And um, 
partly the influence of, of your uh, PM Modi. But um, so, so I, I spent about a month in Ahmedabad across the street from Sabarmati Ashram, which was where Gandhi uh, set up his second ashram and began the, what became the Salt March. And my feeling, I, I went with an expert in heritage tourism who was, and I was joined by a woman named Prati Shah, who's also an environmental specialist. And we, we traveled and I have to say it's 240 miles. I did not walk the whole 240 miles. Why? Because there are long stretches that are highway now. And it's, it's very dangerous to walk along the side of these highways into oncoming traffic, oncoming trucks, oxen, people on bicycles. So I would take drives through those, but I walked through every village from the front beginning to the end. And I walked the last uh, 20 miles in one, you know, in one morning all the way out to the beach in Dandi, where, where famously Gandhi lifted some salt. As I call it the Indians equivalent to the Boston Tea Party, which was a revolution against the British and uh, their taxing, uh, taxation without representation. So the Indians were being taxed for taking salt, for using salt, the British were selling to them. That was fundamentally wrong. Uh, it, it again, several things in India have changed my life. It's humbled me. It's softened me. It's made me quite aware of um, the luxury, even in my humble luxury that I live in. And, and I have a greater appreciation. And uh, I'm now starting to write the book. So you won't see me for nine months. But, uh, but uh, that, and, and before we end, I do want to talk about, and I hope you're going to ask us about. <clears throat> Tourism development and and okay, yeah, that's actually my my <clears throat> question. First with Karen and Perry, you want to add on to it, uh, Karen? So from your experience, uh, who is usually usually coming to India and why? And as we move from present to future, um, what are the kind of like foundations of tourism <laughs> that you see changing? And the one thing I wanted to do was stray away from COVID um, in this discussion. I think we all agreed upon. Uh, staying away from that topic, but there's all these other criteria to talk about, like digital tourism um, and how tourism is kind of changing overall. So I'll start off with you and then Perry, if you want to sure. add to it. Sure, thanks. Thank you. So I think, you know, for us to come to India, it's not a weekend trip. Uh, it's a trip that I think to do it justice needs at least 10 days, and that's the short part of the end. And so who signs up to come to India? Well, you have two types of people, I think tourists. You have the person who wants to continue going back and say, okay, this time I wanna to go to Bombay, or this time I wanna to go to Rajasthan, or this time I wanna to go to Goa, or this time you know, I wanna put in Sri Lanka and part of the trip. Or you have the tourist, and I don't think we'll lose that, that says, I'm going to India once in my life. So I wanna see it all. So that becomes, we're doing the golden triangle. I don't see that changing much as we go forward. And, and I say that sadly, that you will always have a group of people, and now I'm talking Americans, not so much Europeans, that will say, oh, I went to India, you know, as if they made their one, year, their one and only pilgrimage. So I hope to see that changing more and more. And I think that that is going to happen as we go forward. You know, if on any given day, one turns on the TV to watch CNBC and see how the stock market is doing and they're interviewing the various CEOs, inevitably in the course of the day, you're zooming in to Palo Alto or California where many of the tech companies are being headed by Indians. And so the curiosity of their studies in India that brought them to America and, you know, putting the Googles of the world and, and the Ubers of the world on the map, um, even the WeWorks. So I think we are seeing, you know, back in, I remember being told, and obviously people can jump in and correct me, 
But I believe in the 80s, if an Indian ever came to America, they could never come with more than $500. That was the absolute maximum that they could take out of the country. Where now, you know, the diversion of maybe your neighbors grew up in India, but they're living in the suburbs of Westchester or Chicago or California. So the curiosity is much more than it was in the year in the 70s and 80s as it is now. So I, I do feel that's changing. I feel people are far more exposed, you know, whether it's the success of many of our dot-com businesses or industries but I do think we have to try to explore how people can continue to go to India often. And they do look at a window with the weather. So they're looking at going November through March and not experiencing monsoons, etc. cetera. So. Absolutely. Uh, Perry, do you wanna to add to the tourism angle? Uh, yeah, yeah, I have a couple of things to say. Um, I was sitting in a restaurant in a fancy rest French restaurant in, on the New Jersey shore down by Cape May in one of those restaurants where all the tables are too close to each other. So nobody's conversation is private. And this couple who looked, you know, well to do, were talking about where they're going to travel next. And um, he said, well, what about the, we have to see the Taj Mahal. And she said, do we really India? And he said, it's one of the wonders of the world. We have to see it. And I thought, no, don't go. If, if this is the reason you have to get it, you know, check it off on your bucket list. It, it's felt to me like this is the commodification of travel, that you go to a place to, you know, check it off on your list. If you, but to go with a passion and a, and a, and a goal and a direction, uh, this is the new travel. Uh, and now, you know, the, there are a bunch of travel trends that India fits into. Um, spiritual tourism, which I'm going to comment on in a minute. Uh, medical tourism, because you can get uh, the uh, uh, dental work done for like tenth of the price. Uh, heritage tourism, which again, the Maywars taught me a lot about. And there are these heritage hotels, uh, all these, um, the palace hotels. There's Adventure tourism in India now, you can zip line over the Ganges in Rishikesh. Food tours, which are increasingly popular. And art and, archi arc and, art and architecture, of course, thanks to Karen. And, and then the, the bespoke kind of luxury travel. Uh, and, but uh, through them all is the, the overriding, uh, um, I would say theme is experiential. People want to go someplace and experience either the culture, the home, the art, the food. Um, but, you know, checking it off on your bucket list is, is not so interesting. And uh, in fact, with the Taj Mahal, not the Taj Mahal, the uh, Four Seasons Mumbai, I did a story about Dabawalas. You know, um, I, all your Indians know what a Dabawala is. I bring home, um, when I bring home souvenirs, it's like nobody else's souvenirs. This is my gift from a Dabawala. This is, uh, this is the wedding hat I wore at Padma Jha's wedding. But um, the Four Seasons, this is a sign of how experiential you can marry the Indian experience with the, the luxury guests. Four Seasons Hotels has these Four Seasons experiences. So one was a day with the Dabawalas. And they would take four guests and follow a Dabawala around uh, to the train station watching them uh, go on. Let me just uh, say one, two other things. Uh, uh, unlike Karen, and I really admire what you're doing, Karen, especially because it's art and architecture. I have to, another confession, I've only been on one tour in my life and it's because I'm a journalist and I need to you know, find my own way. I don't like to be part of a herd. And personally, I'm a kind of individualist, a lone wolf and I find my experiences are uh, more real to me when I have them alone. But um, uh, so the one experience I did have, I joined a Footsteps of the Buddha tour with a gentleman named Shantam Seth, who um, uh, comes from a very prestigious family. His mother was India's first uh, woman Supreme Court Justice and his brother Vikram 
uh, is the author who wrote A Suitable Boy and, and uh, Golden Gate. Uh, and, uh, and it was a real experience for me because these were people who would have been on Karen's kind of tours coming from, you know, a high end clientele. One of them's last name was Bowden, as in Bowden College, which is a very exclusive small school in New England. And uh, all these people, every evening, we'd have these sessions called Strucks. Uh, what were you struck by? Many of them were struck by the poverty and people coming up to them, bakshish, looking for, you know, uh, money, palms up. But uh, I, going with Shantam and this group, I had an experience that, was unlike any I had had. And it turned me on to the idea that I could join a tour. And uh, one of the ways Karen and I have um, not overlapped is that I've always gone alone and always traveled alone in India. Unless you're a seasoned traveler like me and who's been to India and has people there waiting for you, I don't recommend it, but you know, I still see young backpackers from Australia and Europe doing that. And that's cool. But uh, if you really want to have the, the balance, you know, Karen's kinds of tours are highly recommended. Not for Thank me, you. but others. Uh, spiritual tourism, just the last thing, and then I'll turn it back to you and Karen. So uh, I saw, I just yesterday found an article from 2008 and it said that spiritual tourism is becoming a major growth area of India and the India's travel market. This is from the World Advertising Research Center, WARP, 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 um, which is ironic to me because in 2006, I wrote a story for the New York Times about how spiritual tourism was on the rise. And I pointed out that the Buddha was probably the first to create a, a tour, a spiritual tour, because he had suggested these four sacred places where he had had experiences of enlightenment, Bodh Gaya, Sarnath, etc. Uh, but so uh, spiritual, the, the reason, part of the reason will remain spirituality. And, and that does not die. In fact, it grows. And if, if the kinds of things, Karen, you do inherently you know, art inherently is about spirituality, I feel. And so, you know, there's only one place where you can do that, in my mind, is India. So we'll see that market grow and somehow related to uh, more disenchantment with the wisdom of the West and finding it in the East again. Bus. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, with that, so we have a uh, lots of great questions that have come in. So for the next 10 minutes, we're going to do sort of rapid fire so we can get through all the questions. Um, so like two to three sentence answers. We're going to start with actually my last question. Um, given all your experiences, the both of you as people going up outside, but coming to a country um, and immersing yourselves here, how would you say one experiences the nuances of culture properly? And not necessarily in India, but like Karen. as a track. How do you okay. explain? Can you hear me all right? I, I, yeah. I know. Yes. The, okay. So I must say walking a city, and it's very difficult to walk in India, as we all know, because of sidewalks, etc. But to really put your sneakers on, walk, see the stalls, see the people out on the streets, um, you know, do that and do it at all different hours, whether you're doing it at six in the morning or you're doing it at 7 p.m. at night, but really walk. That would be how to experience it. Perry? Uh, in one word, meditation. I learned what meditation is and beginning steps and how to meditate in India. And why do I say that about the nuances? Because uh, meditation teaches you to be aware and in the present moment. So, and, and this is sort of doubles up as a journalist, being all sensory. So I, as Karen, you know, walking, I love to walk. Uh, I tried to ride a bicycle once in India and that landed in a gutter. I will never do that again in Udaipur. 
But um, when you draw on your senses, <laughs> smell, sight, sound, um, all, all five senses, you begin to uh, understand this complicated, complex, frustrating, fascinating country fully with all the senses of your body. Perfect, thank you. So now the audience questions. Uh, first up, what are some other interesting cross-cultural exchanges and cross-pollinations we have seen with other Western nations, uh, French, Portuguese, or Dutch? And this is to both of you. You mean from India? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Harry? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is, is Goa. Uh, the last uh, state the, which uh, Portuguese had been, it had been a colony of uh, Portugal. And uh, when I went to Goa, I lived on fish and, and it was sardines, a lot of sardines. So the Portuguese brought that. They also brought, you can say, Catholicism to India. Uh, um, and the cross-pollination, what were the other countries? Uh, French, way? Portuguese, or Dutch influence. I can't speak to those, actually. <laughs> That's <laughs> completely OK. Karen, any other interesting cross-cultural exchanges that you've seen, maybe specifically with an art? Yeah, well, I have to say, in terms of cross-cultural, I think every woman has to turn to thank India for wearing shawls because there isn't a time that, you know, you don't go to India and you're looking at shawls. And, and I mean, that's such a fashion statement. And I really do believe that it does come from India, you know, in terms of the use of shawls. And that, that's, a fashion, that's a fashion statement. Also cross-cultural, I think for us is to see the various foods that have popped up throughout the world, thanks to India and vice versa. Absolutely. Continuing down the list, uh, Perry, what are your views on how Western media, whether it's film, journalism, or literature, has depicted Indian culture? Uh, cliche stereotypes. Uh, um, and if not that, um, it's, it's uh, adulation and admiration. Uh, you know, uh, our chief medical reporter for CNN, Sanjay Gupta, uh, vice president of the United States of America will be a woman whose family comes from Odisha, right? Uh, Kamala Harris. So uh, uh, the, the media, the Western media looks at India, it's the way the media looks at everything. It's either, you know, glowing or tragic. There's no middle ground. I don't think there's enough writing about the arts of India. Um, I just saw a profile of an Indian chef in Toronto and his story was he came from poverty in India now to be a top chef. So we, and I say the, you know, the, the, the royal fourth wall of journalism, we tend to look for conflict or the, you know, differences and, and I have to say, I, I don't admire that. It's so much more subtle. Uh, there are some writers who, who do that and uh, have had roots in India. You're one example. Yeah, thank you. Next question to Karen. Do you have a favorite Indian artist? You know, that is such a hard question. That is really a hard question. I'm going to say no. I don't have a favorite because it's very hard to compare. You know, if you're looking at antiquities or you're looking at the modern art world or you're looking at the contemporary art world. So no, I'm going to have to say no, but you have to appreciate each and every period. Um, so I can't, I can't zone in on that. Okay, do you have maybe a few or a few that you have uh... I know you mentioned M.F. Hussein. So like maybe a couple other names that come to mind that sure, particularly think, inspire you? Sure, I think um, trying to 
study Indian art, which even though I had an art history background and graduated from school in the 80s, I never once heard an Indian art name in my art history classes. So as I progressed into the two years, the 2000s, um, I was able to learn about the various movements of M.F. Hussein, Sousa, um, and then I had the great fortune when I was with Bodhi to be able to go to various Indian art gal um, Indian, I want to say ateliers, but they're, they're whether it was there, I say they're, uh, yeah, they're ateliers is probably the best word. When I went with Sabodes, I went to Bartis, I went to Atul Dodia, Anjus, Jiddish, um, his wife. So I think when you're exposed to an artist, a contemporary artist, and you get to understand the individuals and what motivated them to bring various pieces to life, it, it means something to you. Perfect. Uh, flipping the same question over to you, Perry. Um, any Indian literature or writers that has inspired you and that you've encountered over your time? Well, uh, you know, I thought about this one, and while I'm, you know, I'm, I'm reading most of Gandhi's works, the one, the one who jumps out of me and has been in my life since uh, I graduated from college, I may have read him in college is Tagore. He's a, a poet of, of profound influence. Uh, he's deeply spiritual and, and has a sense of humor. So I would just, for the sake of uh, expediency, I'll just say, read Tagore. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, next question, what impact? Um, you know, we talked about soft power, right? We talked about uh, soft power through art, through food. Um, other influences such as internal sociocultural or political scenarios that might affect and alter Western opinions about the country of India? Somebody asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, uh, <laughs> I hate to say this sounds like you, so you want to be a millionaire. Will you repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, what impact does India's, uh, you know, cultural or political scenarios that are having like internally within the country? Um, you know, Indian news isn't always like fully captured, I think, outside of India. Um, but the news that does escape, you know, does it alter Western opinions about the country? And if so, how? Okay, here's, here's my thought. And I'm not sure if it answers this, but one of the things I've seen, I, I interviewed uh, Ronnie Scruvala, who's a, a film, a television and film producer who put something like $180 million into uh, um, sustenance for the poor in the villages of Maharashtra. So uh, two things from this. One is that he, he's a leader in altruism. He's leading the way for people with a lot of money in India to give back to the community. This, uh, although it's written in the great, um, you know, in the Mahabharata and the Ramayana about selfless giving, um, Indians for reasons that, you know, we can talk about the economics of India, this has been slow coming. So, so philanthropy is a, is a, is a new phenomenon and, and it's growing and I really admire that. I actually forgot the other thing that I was gonna say, so. Uh, you can turn to Karen. Oh, oh, let me just say from That's Ronnie again. Okay, Karen, did you have any? No, no. Let me oh. let me let me just finish this thought because it's really important. We're talking about the social fabric of India. So, out of this experience that I had with Ronnie Scruvala and watching myself, there's an aspiration, uh, an aspirational I idea that is rising, and this is partly why the middle class is rising. That uh, you know, we grew up in America thinking anyone can be president. And unfortunately, that came true four years ago. <laughs> but, um, but there is that sense that uh, the combination of entrepreneurship, that you can start your own company from your home. And I've seen small companies of millennials in closets that are growing and you know, grow into multi-million dollar companies. So I think that's a, a, a value 
that's growing in India that you can you can rise and uh, and and I love it because it sort of denies this prism that the caste and class system of India leaves an Indian in. So you can break out of that. Perfect. I think I am getting the signal that it is time to wrap up. Um, closing thoughts. Thank you very much to both of you. Uh, I think great topics were covered. I apologize if my internet connection broke out at times. Um, did my best. I'm actually underneath the stairway in our hotel room right next to the Wi-Fi box, um, praying that the power doesn't go out. So I think we survived for the most part. Uh, we did, thank you, did. Karen. Thank you, Perry. I'm going to pass it back off to the AVID team to close us out. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. My pleasure as well. Thank and, you, you know, fascinating uh, perspectives on, on India. You know, it just brought me back to uh, some thoughts I had, uh, I mean, you know, when I first reached the U.S. and I first reached New York and I worked there, everyone said, Asad, when you're getting married, we want to come to India for a monsoon wedding. And I would say no one gets married in the monsoons. You have to come in December. That's when people get married. And by the time I left uh, uh, the U.S. to come move back to India, Asad, I thought of you yesterday. I said, why? I watched Slumdog Millionaire. I said, but why did you think of me? But just, you know, to think of these, these perspectives that people have, uh, sometimes biased, sometimes correct. Um, but, you know, India is obviously a, a wonderful, mystical, magical place that cannot be, you know, synthesized into one, one single thought. Uh, but, you know, thank you, guys. This was such an interesting conversation. Um, and I'd also like to thank our, our outreach partners, Rare India, uh, for helping uh, in this event. Uh, thank you to audiences. Ho hope you enjoyed uh, the session and we'll tune in for more Avid Online programs. Our, our final program for 2020 uh, is on next Saturday. It's a, a program on the art and aesthetics of black and white photography with Himanshu Seth, which is on next Saturday, the 19th. To find out more, check out our website, follow us, or stalk us on show, social media. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and remember that learning never stops. Thank you once again for a wonderful session. Thank you, everyone.